Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, the new home of power mining analysis. In today's video, we've welcomed back the CEO of Bit Digital, Sam Tabar, to give us an update on their business. This one's super exciting. They just came out with February production results and we're starting to see some revenue from their HPC or AI business unit. Now, before we get into all that, please take a second, hit the like button, you guys. It's a big help to myself, Anthony, and the channel. It helps get this content to other people who may find value. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join and let us know in the comment section below what you think of Bit Digital, if you're currently holding shares, and if you have any additional questions we didn't get to in today's interview. Now, with that being said, let's get into today's video. Okay guys, so that's right, back by popular demand, we have the CEO of Bit Digital, Sam Tabar, on the program. We just put out a summary of February production results, talking about some of the highlights from Bit Digital. A very exciting time for you, Sam, as we're now starting to see that initial revenue come through from the HPC AI contract. But there's so much right. more to this story. We were just talking about the balance sheet, the Ethereum staking. You've obviously got your core proprietary mining as well. So this is a really exciting story. I want to get into all that. But first and foremost, thanks so much for making time for us today, Sam. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, you're most welcome. Uh, last video did very well, so you're always welcome here, my friend. Now, first things first, let's uh, get a, a quick high-level summary of Bit Digital. You guys are one of the, the smaller, lesser-known miners right now, so for people who are maybe unfamiliar with the story, uh, what's the elevator pitch for you guys? We may be small, but we're pretty smart. So Bit Digital is a large-scale, sustainable-focused Bitcoin miner and a AI infrastructure services provider. We have locations in the United States, Canada, in Iceland. And we're currently running about 2.73 exahash as of the end of February. Our target is 6.0 exahash by the end of the year. We recently began generating revenue uh, with our AI business. We're earning about $50 million annually with a, th a three year contract. That contract is expected to be earning about $100 million by the end of the year, which would mean $300 million at least over three years and uh, that could be even bigger. We are also actively staking ETH. We have about 12,000 ETH currently staked. We're the only Bitcoin miner that offers exposure to staking economics. And we focus on maintaining a super pristine, clean balance sheet. We pursue counter cyclical growth so that when miners are cheap, we buy them and we avoid high price growth during bull runs. Amazing. Yeah, I want to get into the Ethereum staking because that's a key differentiator. Anthony and I actually were talking about that on the podcast, Sam. Uh, the only publicly traded miner with the Ethereum staking exposure, and that continues to grow and grow. So why don't you tell us um, why are you so excited about Ethereum? We're starting to see some of the ETF or Ethereum ETF news in the, in the media as well. What do you think Ethereum has in store for 2024? But well, first of all, let's start with one thing. Bitcoin and Ethereum are not competing with each other. Bitcoin is the mother coin. It's the, it's a store of value. It's digital gold. And right now, I believe gold is about $15 trillion in market cap. And Bitcoin is about $1.5 trillion in market cap. I believe eventually that Bitcoin will continue to grow and eat into the gold capital markets because Gold is always constantly used as a hedge towards inflation. Bitcoin provides for that. It solves for that. We don't need a yellow piece of rock to hedge our inflation. Bitcoin is digital gold when it could use Bitcoin to hedge our inflation. So I do believe the market cap for Bitcoin will grow exponentially. However, Ethereum is under $500 billion market cap. Ethereum is a very different value proposition. It has the ability to write the entire financial system. It has a code called Solidity, which carries if then statements, and you could rewrite all sorts of financial provisions. It could replace banks, it could replace even lawyers, because it has a code in which you could program the flow of money. That is a far more threatening technology than Bitcoin, because again, Bitcoin is something you hold and it has value. Whereas Ethereum, you could actually rewrite the financial system. I can create if then statements. For example, if you do something, my Ethereum will go to your wallet 
automatically without a middleman, without escrow. That's just one example of what Ethereum could do. Bitcoin can't replace lawyers, Ethereum can. So it's very interesting for us. On top of that, Ethereum has the ability to stake so you can capture a yield. There is no halving event in Ethereum. So once people begin to realize the value, the fundamental value of Ethereum, that thing is going to, we believe, go up a lot. And Bitcoin, of course, we're, bull we're bullish on. We do believe that it's going to eat market cap on gold. But Ethereum is far more fundamental in that it has actual fundamental value with its programming capabilities that Bitcoin doesn't. So we're the only Bitcoin miner in the entire sector that's hodling massive amounts of Ethereum. And this is the this is one wonderful way for the capital markets to expose themselves to Ethereum and to its staking economics. And again, no having event in Ethereum. So that puts us in a pretty pretty position. It most definitely does. Yeah, I, I've looked into Ethereum quite a bit. You talk about the smart contracts, the technology there, um, and the versatility of, of Ethereum versus Bitcoin. I think you're definitely on to something there, Sam. And, and again, caught both Anthony and I's attention on the February results. Now, the other thing that caught our attention was uh, the initial revenue coming off that big AI contract. So you've alluded to uh, the annualized revenue. We were expecting around $4 million a month if you break it down on a monthly basis for $48, $50 million a year. That's exactly what you guys delivered. So right on pace. So why don't you talk to us a little bit about that? Um, that client, you've continued to increase the value of that contract. So a super lucrative opportunity for Bit Digital, And as far as I know, the biggest one out of any of the miners right now uh, in the public it markets. It certainly is. And we, we chose, look, we chose to wait to announce our AI business until we had an anchor customer. We didn't want to just announce aspirations like many other companies in our sector has done in the past. It turned out to be fluff. We do have an NDA with our customer. Unfortunately, our customer wishes to remain under the radar. We want to accommodate those needs. And frankly, there are competitive benefits for us to keep our clients, uh, you know, keep our clients. Uh, we don't want to let everybody know who our clients are. And we continue with client development. We are uh, speaking to now four different clients in various parts of the world. And I'm pretty bullish that we're going to be onboarding a number of, of uh, notable clients um, in the near term future to grow onto that revenue that we are forecasting to be about $100 million a year, if not more. So yeah, we're actively growing the business with an active pipeline. Uh, we hope to announce that in the near term future. The returns profile for the AI business is really great. We would need substantially higher Bitcoin prices for investing in ASICs to offer a superior ROI. So we believe our AI business helps us become more opportunistic in growing our Bitcoin mining fleet with recurring revenue that helps us fund ASIC purchases. So we're just, look, we're, we're focused on building a business that can endure all parts of the cycle and thrive in bull markets and not just live and die by every tick in the hash price. And I don't want to run a business on hope. A lot of these Bitcoin miners, including the big ones, hope that Bitcoin goes up. That's a bad business strategy. The way you really want to run a business is not through hope, but that you have the ability to be impervious no matter where you are in the cycle. Public company market strategies should be informed by maximizing returns for all shareholders and stakeholders in a responsible way. So look, pursuing this AI business for what we thought was responsible, it presents us a best returns profile for investors. Uh, importantly, we wouldn't make capital markets decisions or capital allocation decisions uh, on the absence of a customer contract, which is what a lot of these Bitcoin miners did. They just, I, I believe, you know, they see the hype in AI and they're just announcing these aspirations and, you know, potential dreams, but they don't actually have a, a customer. So just buying thousands of GPUs on spec and this quote of like, if you build it, they will come. That's just not a mentality we adopt. Uh, we're, we're capital allocators and asset management specialists. And with this AI business, it fits very neatly within our core competencies. What is that? Procuring specialized machines, identifying a data center, 
harnessing the client, putting that all together, creating a business. Yeah, and I know we talked about the. By the way, by the way I have to remind you, not only does Ethereum not having a ha- not have an app having event, but AI has no having event either. <laughs> Fairly noted, yeah. And we've talked about uh, how how running a business on hope obviously isn't isn't a great long term strategy, Sam. And I really do like how you guys have set up some recurring revenue streams. Again, independent of the price of Bitcoin or the having or any of that other uh, noise in the media right now. Now I'm curious uh, because one of the questions we got from the audience was, in addition to this anchor client, what are we doing in terms of other clients in the AI space? And because this is a new technology, are you finding people are actually approaching you guys? Uh, because they've heard about your yeah. capability, or is it the other way around? Yes, it's definitely we. Everything, everything has been reverse inquiry. Everything we have, we have. This is how many people we have in our sales force. Zero. Everything has been reverse inquiry, and our cup is full. Uh, the we've identified four that we like, um, and it, it, it's it, the fact that we've been able to execute uh, so so beautifully on a massive client we can now show a track record that we've been able to execute on customized solutions for people building llms so that we can power and rent that specialized computational power so yeah it's been it's been a good it's a it's a problem don't get me wrong but it's a champagne problem it's it's a great problem to have uh and we just have to figure out the most optimal way in terms of which clients do we take on board and so on. So yeah, I am bullish that we'll um, continue to make this into a, um, a business and not just one anchor client. Uh, but having said that, this anchor client is is fantastic and that is going to continue to grow. Uh, we're already at 50 million run rate over the next three years. We think that's going to grow to much more than that, up to 100. That does not include the other clients we're speaking to. Yeah, how nice is that? You don't have to pay a, pay a marketing or sales uh, staff and you've got a full list of or, or lineup of people wanting to, to give you revenue. That's great. And I like the champagne problem analogy. I've heard that before. Uh, it's a good problem to have, but never phrased like that. Now, um, Sam, you mentioned uh, the AI hype. And, and I think there are a lot of companies that have really, you even see name changes and stuff like that to attach themselves or ride on some of the coattails of this AI bandwagon. Yeah, um, but in yeah. your opinion, and, and I actually know I've a few CEOs in the Bitcoin mining space as well that we talked to that just don't believe it's here to stay. So in your opinion and that of Bit Digital, is HPC AI uh, just a flash in the pan or is, is this uh, here to stay and fundamentally going to change how we operate our lives? Those guys, if you interviewed them in 2000, they would probably be like, oh yeah, dot com, total fad, the internet is going to go away. Anyway, um, NVIDIA's GPU revenue is expected to double in 2025 to around $90 billion, with the majority of that coming from lar- the largest tech companies in the world that are developing their own AI models. Meta alone is expected to spend over $10 billion in GPUs in 2024. If they spent that on ASICs instead, they would have more than the, I think, basically more than the entire network hash rate as of of today. So if AI turns out to a fad based on the amount of global market cap predicated on AI application uh, valuations, the global economy would be in significant (laughs) trouble. AI is being applied across sectors, entertainment, healthcare, finance, automobile. Large language models are continuously evolving and leading to new capabilities. It's eating up a lot of the industries. HPCs, which what we have, are essential to complex AI computational tasks. It, it, it enables the processing of analysts of vast amounts of data at speeds not possible with the standard computer. So we fill in that speed, that sweet spot in the ecosystem. And the demand for HPC resources are only growing. They're driven by the increasing need for processing power, which is only going to grow. This trend is likely to continue as data volumes and computational requirements continue to increase. There you go. 
I was going to say there'll be a lot of angry NVIDIA shareholders if this turns out to be uh, to be a bubble or whatever, Sam. But um, yeah, I think I think you're definitely right. And for my personal opinion, I think AI is is most definitely here to stay and, and revolutionize kind of yeah. how we operate. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, it's funny. There's like so there's NVIDIA. Then there's like these second order effect companies like Supermicro, which is why their market cap's gone up a lot. But no one's been looking yet at the third order effect. And that's us where we are, you know, there's the NVIDIA, then Supermicro, and then there's Bit Digital, and we're in that ecosystem, but the capital markets haven't realized the third order effect of AI, and we just haven't received credit in the capital markets. Look, eventually that's going to change. Time is our friend, uh, but I'm not gonna pretend I haven't been frustrated. The capital markets have, have not given us credit for this yet. Yeah, it is frustrating and surprising to both Anthony and I as well. And and we're looking, Sam, we're here, we're watching, and we'll follow the story all the way up because this is exactly what the retail audience wants is to find these stories before uh, Wall Street and, and the big banks do, right? Now, um, one follow-up question on the HPC uh, front. I know top line revenue is based on this contract. We've talked about our phenomenal. You, you keep alluding to the margins, the margins, very, very profitable business. Do you have any information you can share on what these margins are going to look like? I mean, our earnings are going to come out, so that's uh, there should be some some detail there. Okay, you'll see. It. Fair enough. Yeah, that that's revenues. That 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 will eventually come out, but they they're lucrative. Great. Yeah, I'm I'm curious to see that and uh, about the amount of capex that's involved to get these um, solutions set up and out the door. But obviously, uh, we can't get into that today. But definitely one that we'll talk about in the future. Now, next question for you, switching gears a little bit, balance sheet. So we talked before we started filming here about the zero debt position. Obviously, you've got a lot of crypto or Ethereum, Bitcoin on the balance sheet. You've got a good cash position as well. Balance sheet strength is crucially important going into the halving, as we all know. We have $140 million in total liquidity. Cash is about $35 million. Digital assets is $105 million. A lot of that is in Ethereum too. We have zero leverage. We have zero unfunded minor purchase obligations. We have zero infrastructure capex funding requirements. Gotcha. So a strong balance sheet, we'll say. Um, and obviously going into having that's super important. Has that been your strategy the whole time, Sam, is just to have an airtight balance sheet heading into April here? We've always had an airtight balance sheet and it had nothing to do with the having. The issue is if you start uh, putting on leverage on a balance sheet when it comes to Bitcoin mining, the only when you're doing the number crunching on 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 financial analysis when you're borrowing money, you you don't know where the price of Bitcoin is going to be, so you cannot predict your cash flows in the future, and that's why a lot of peers in our sector they took on a lot of leverage in the past, they drank their own Kool Aid when it comes to the hype train on Bitcoin, and then they went bankrupt. So we felt that was not a good idea to take on leverage because you cannot predict the cash flows on Bitcoin mining. If you borrow money to buy Bitcoin mining, Bitcoin mining equipment, and you don't know where the Bitcoin price is going to be in the future, you can get in massive trouble. Taking credit and leverage on, for example, our AI contract, where we have certainty of revenue, we have certainty of revenue, no matter what happens, we're getting certainty of revenue. That makes sense. Maybe taking on some leverage, buying even more equipment to fulfill the appetite for all these clients. That can make sense because you can predict your cash flow and you can meet these future liabilities. You can't do that with Bitcoin mining equipment. That's why we never took on leverage on our balance sheet when it comes to Bitcoin mining equipment. It had nothing to do with the halving. It's just thinking about the situation. Don't take on leverage when you can't predict cash flow. Sure. And and good segue into the next question, which is about Bitcoin mining equipment. Um, I was, wanted to get your take on all the ATMs and everything we're seeing from some of your peers as well. But uh, you guys have stated that you've got an end of year target of six exahash, which is phenomenal, okay. really moving kind of into that mid tier in terms of proprietary mining. Um, are you still on track to deliver that? You just mentioned there's no unfunded <laughs> equipment purchases. So can you give us a bit of an update on the growth, paying for the growth, the units, all the rest there, Sam? Yeah. So last year we announced doubling our, our hash rate, uh, which we did by the end of the year. And this year we're doing it again. So we do have a track record. Um, 
We we believe we're on track. It's March. We'll get to three soon, and that leaves us plenty of room to get to six exahash by the end of the year. But again, we're not um, we're not trying to be the the, the hugest uh, ones on the block. That you, there's a lot of vulnerability in in growing at any price and just growing. You just don't know where things are going to go, and. To grow into a business where your margins are going to be cut in half very soon, it sounds a little crazy to me. And that's why, you know, we have the Ethereum staking, we have this incredible AI vertical, and at the same time, we stay in the game on Bitcoin mining. So if Bitcoin goes up greatly, that's fantastic. We do extremely, extremely well. And if it doesn't, we're impervious because we have these other things. That's that's the situation you want to be in. I'm unsure why. The capital markets have not seen that. I know there's like a, a rabid retail following of certain um, uh, peers in our sector, but they're not thinking about this properly. They're not thinking about it correctly. Yeah, it, it's a really a key differentiator. And the more I talk to you guys, the more we research and learn about Bit Digital. It is just fundamentally a different mindset and company and you're right Sam you don't need the growth at all costs to be the biggest company around to make phenomenal returns generate a lot of money for shareholders um, exactly. yeah there's a lot of opportunity here uh, so I really do like what you're saying and, and like the strategy behind bit digital and, and how you've organized things now speaking of strategy you guys for for a long time have kind of had that asset light strategy using your host facilities and, and mining uh, in yeah. that fashion. What are your thoughts there? Are we going to see that continue in 2024 or shift away? Look, Fred is right um, of Mara when he says that, you know, if you, the, the, the third party, if you're not vertically um, completely integrated, uh, you're not going to capture all the upside. He's right. We are not completely vertically integrated. We felt that there was danger in having a bunch of data centers that you own because we thought and we're right buying the machines creates and not buying the property creates the highest value because buying data centers is not necessarily good roi there is a much more valuables than just buying the machines but look we do have revenue shares uh, we have six operating partners in the united states canada and iceland we create competitive tension between those operating partners to get the best, uh, to get the best deal possible, to get the best economics possible, and we strike these revenue shares with these operating partners so that their interests in the, are aligned in making sure these machines run well. But we do give up a little bit on the upside, but we like that because we remain nimble. We can continue replacing the operating partners when we find better economic terms. Also, from a regulatory perspective. If you have a data center, for example, in one state, and it, suddenly that state decides to have regulatory action against Bitcoin mining, they're, they're, they're screwed. And so we want to remain very nimble from a jurisdictional perspective so that we can solve for that. And we don't think we're being that paranoid. Our fleet was once upon a time all in China many years ago at this point. We decided that was a risk. And we migrated our entire fleet from China to North America. There's absolutely nothing in China right now, no opera, no machines or anything. It's been a while. But we were right. We started that migration six months before they announced a ban on Bitcoin. And we were right to have that mindset of diversifying your jurisdictional risk. And so that's why we have it in a number of, the, a number of states in the States, Canada and Iceland, which, by the way, of all first world jurisdictions, we don't have the courage necessarily to go to um, a country that, you know, from a political and regulatory standpoint, things can change very quickly and get the rug pulled from under you. So we just wanted to stay in countries where contracts are honored and things are stable. But we like the fact that we're positioned well from, a, from, a, from a, an asset light, jurisdictional diversified perspective, because it make sure that it measures our downside. But we do give up a little bit on the upside because of the revenue share. That is true. 
Sure. And, and you're right. The political thing is something that's continuing to evolve. Bitcoin's still very new, right? And we're seeing that evolve in North America, South America, all over the world. But there's also risk in, in being really centralized just based on natural disasters or environment or weather or climate and stuff yeah. like that, too. So, Absolutely. yeah, no, I, I hear you there, Sam, for sure. Um, now, you've done a really good job, at least in my opinion today, uh, telling people why Bit Digital is a great alternative compared to the other miners or what's differentiated you guys? How are you different? But as a sector overall, why should viewers or investors put their money in Bitcoin miners as opposed to the Bitcoin ETF right now, Sam? Well, Bitcoin ETFs are not leveraged. Um, so it's uh, that's, I think, one of the reasons why the sector... It, 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 I, I think it's I think it's been downward pressure on the sector, the ETFs, because now people have more on the menu to express their Bitcoin aspirations. Now, ETFs are not leveraged. In some ways, the Bitcoin mining sector is more leveraged. MicroStrategy is even more leveraged. That's why MicroStrategy has done particularly well. There's a lot on the menu uh, when it comes to people choosing how to express their Bitcoin aspirations. And the ETFs is just another thing on the menu. Now, now at the same time, the ETFs have driven Bitcoin prices to an even higher level to uh, to where it was in a while. So it's been positive, but in terms of the Bitcoin mining sector, um, at least those Bitcoin mining sectors that have their entire eggs in the basket of Bitcoin mining, um, it's been net net in terms of you know the the margins compressing. In, by 50% and Bitcoin going up. I think Bitcoin needs to go up to somewhere between 80 to 100,000 to make up for these margin compressions to some degree, more or less. That's the range. Yeah, really interesting take. That was Anthony and I's kind of assumption as well. We've seen kind of a decoupling again of Bitcoin prices and the miners. Uh, some days we were just saying, Sam, Bitcoin will be up 7%. The miners are down yeah. 7%. And I think you're yeah. exactly right. People as a whole are just saying, hey, the Bitcoin miners have having coming. There's uncertainty. The market doesn't like that. Let's put our money in the ETF until we see kind of how this shakes out. Um, so astute, yeah. astute uh, observation. And I think you're, you're bang on there. Um, unfortunately for Bit Digital, they've kind of lumped you in with all the other peer play miners right. and, and not necessarily picked up on some of these. Uh, points of differentiation but um, no great great commentary I'll kick it back to you for any final thoughts Sam uh, always a good discussion welcome back we will be excited to see the earnings come out and start to see some of the margins on that HPC um, but any closing thoughts for the viewers no you 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 basically said that the earnings are going to be coming out shortly people will see uh, that we were we were, we were we were walking the talk and uh, we look forward to that I think, again, um, people have just lumped us into the Bitcoin mining sector, which is fine. We are a Bitcoin miner. We do have that vertical. But if you do the research a little bit more, I would encourage the audience to just do the research a little bit more and see who's playing it right and smart. And being the most biggest is not necessarily being the smartest. Great. A perfect way to end it, Sam. Thanks so much for your time. You guys, if you're still watching, hit the like button. It helps get this content to other people who may find value in Bit Digital. If you're not subscribed to the channel, McNally Money, feel free to join. And of course, leave a comment in the section below, especially if you're holding shares or if we didn't get to maybe any of the questions that you had for Sam today. You guys, thanks again for watching. Sam, we appreciate your time. We'll see you soon. Thanks for having me.